finally in the last chapter, we're going to be talking about radicals. So an introduction to radical expressions, that's our first section, A1. So when we raise a number to the second power, what do we say? We have squared that number. And we're pretty comfortable with going in that direction. But sometimes we need to do the reverse and actually find the number that we squared to get there. This is called finding a, that's super important, a square root. And we'll talk about why that's singular, finding a square root, not um, the square root, not definite, the only one. Okay, so the number c is a square root of a. If I can take that value and square it and get a out. So every positive number has two square roots. That's why when we're finding a square root, it's not the square root, it's just one option. So every positive number has two square roots. So example, the square roots of 25, square roots of 25 are what? Five, since I can take five and square it, since five squared is 25. But what's my other option? I could also plug in negative five, because if I take negative five, that quantity, and square it, negative times a negative gives me, again, positive. Gives me that value out. So we're finding a square root, not the square root, because we have two different options. So the positive square root is also called the principle. Principle. Principle root just means positive. So if I'm asking for the principal root of 25, that value is 5. If I'm asking for all of the square roots, then I have two of those options. Or I could even ask for the negative root. So the radical symbol, the little check mark with the long line, represents only that principal root, only the positive. So it's specifically saying I've got positive out on the front. And to name the negative square root of a number, we use the little negative out on front. So if I throw a negative, now I'm not dealing with the principal. I'm actually asking for that second option. What is the negative root? So what are the square roots of 81? And again, I've got that plural s that's involved. So what are the square roots of 81? First option, I could multiply 9 times 9 and get 81 out. My other option? negative. Negative times a negative gives me the positive. So let's take each of these. First, am I asking for the principal root or the negative root? Principal, that's positive. So what number do I have to multiply by itself to get me 225? 15. And again, we're asking for the principal or the positive root. But in part B, I'm asking for the negative root. So what do I have to multiply it times itself to get me 64? 8, and I'm asking for the negative root. So go ahead and take those next few and calculate if we're asking for the positive radicand or the negative. So for part A, what is the square root of 16? 4, we were asking for the principal root. For part B, we're asking for the principal root. 7 times 7 gives us 49. For part C, again, still principal, still positive. 10 times 10 gets us to 100. For part D, we're asking for the positive. 21 times 21 gets us to 441. And for part E, we're asking for the negative root of 49. So in this case, we have negative 7. And F, again, the negative root of 169 is negative 13. We can always check if I take that number and square it, do I get the thing on the inside in all of those cases. So we can think of these processes, squaring a number and finding the square root, as inverses of each other. They're undoing what the other is producing. So that's what an inverse does. So we often need to use rational numbers to approximate the square roots 
that are irrational. So what does that mean? I'm trying to take the square root of a number that isn't a perfect square. So if I take the square root of 100, 100 is a perfect square of 10, so it evaluates out really easily. But in cases like these, if I try to take the square root of 10, there's no whole rational number multiplied by itself that will give me 10. So we have to approximate these, which means we need that little bacon squiggle symbol again. It's not exactly equal to since we're going to round and cut off some of the value. So what is the square root of 10? What number do I need to multiply by itself to get me to 10? So if we approximate it in the calculator, you can actually see if we take the square root of 10, we get out 3.16227. And we want to be able to approximate that. We want to round it to three decimal places. So I have another approximation from my approximation. And three decimal places in, to the right of it is a 2, so I'm rounding down and chopping off the rest of that number. So approximately 3.162. So if I take that number and square it, I get around 10. Okay. Next one, I've got the negative radical. So this one we were asking for the principal or the positive one. I want the negative one, so I know it's going to be negative. And I'm trying to take the square root of a decimal, so it's going to be ugly. But what number do we need to multiply by itself to get us 583.8? So again, Punching into the calculator, we're looking for the square root of 583.8. And we get out around negative 24.16195. And again, we're going to approximate it farther, rounding to three decimal places. So one, two, three in. Looking to the right, it's larger than five, so we need to round up. So I'm looking at negative 24.162. If I take that number and square it, I should get around 583.8. And very last, same thing with the fraction. There isn't a perfect square that will multiply out to 48 over 55. So again, plugging it into the calculator, square root 48 over 55, we're approximating it to be 0.934198. And we want to approximate it to three decimal places. So one, two, three. Thing to the right is less than five, so we chop off the rest of that number. So for these irrational numbers on the inside, we have to use a calculator to approximate. So I'm not going to give you any kinds of those on the exam because you can't use a calculator. But I want you to know that it's not always going to be a nice case on the inside there. We might not always have a perfect square.